Okay, uh, thanks a lot everyone for attending our session. I'm just going to quickly introduce uh, two of our colleagues here. Uh, so I've got uh, Andre Leroux. He's the radar business manager um, within the radar group at the CSR. He's managed that since 2010. Um, wealth of experience, one of, or one of our most experienced engineers and uh, quite well known uh, internationally actually in the radar space. So for instance, um, he was responsible for the development of the RSR940, which was installed on the SAN uh, frigates. Um, he's currently the CSR program manager for the development of the Quad Dome Radar with Hansel, which is going to be the subject of uh, today's discussion. Uh, accompanying him is um, Jaco Boerter, uh, a radar specialist and program manager uh, at Henselt uh, in South Africa. So Henselt is one of our industry partners that we're currently involved in a joint technology development commercialization program that uh, these two folks are going to be talking about. Um, Yako has got a master's in electronic engineering. Um, <clears throat> he earned his pedigree at uh, Denel, uh, primarily as a software engineer. Uh, and um, yeah, he's currently um, doing a good job uh, at Hensel. So I'll leave it to the two colleagues to kick us off on this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Innocent. Um, right, so yeah, thanks for the opportunity to tell you about this joint development that the CSR is doing with Hensel. Um, and I'm very pleased to have Jakob Boerter who is the program manager of the Total Rotor development. Um, I'm sort of program managing the CSR portion, but he's responsible for the total program on this development. Um, oh. So the goal here is not to go into any kind of technical detail, but really sort of share our approach from a programmatic point of view, some of the how we form the partnership, what's behind it, and um, yeah, some of the challenges we have and how we're addressing those. So in the Hensholt uh, Germany group, we have a product called TRS3D. There's also a twin, TRML3D. So the TRS3D is a naval application radar and the TRS, um, TRML3D is a land application radar. So these systems came to end of life after about um, 20 years of being um, deployed in a the field, these systems became old, the technology became irrelevant, and some of the components became obsolete. So there was a requirement to replace these systems with modern state-of-the-art radars. So this created the need to develop a new medium-range surveillance radar. And um, Germany, our colleagues in Germany was aware of the capability that exists in South Africa, um, in Hensel South Africa, as well as in the CSIR. And they also had the requirement that this system should be ITAR free. So for those of you that don't know, that is the American um, regulation of defense systems and the control of export of, of uh, systems and components, as well as to be German free. BAFA is the German um, control of, of uh, military components. And uh, there was the need to leverage the technology that exists in, in South Africa, mainly that mainly resides at the CSIR, and also to build capability and to come up with an affordable uh, technology proposition to develop a system that will be low cost and that will be affordable that we can quickly um, get to the market. So, and, and so that um, created the need to develop a new system. So th there's two variants of this system that is now being developed. The one is Quadome, that is the naval uh, surveillance radar, and then the Quadome land, that's the land surveillance radar. So the one will be um, used in naval applications on ships like frigates, corvettes, and offshore patrol vessels and then the land application, mainly in uh, defense or defense force uh, applications. Right, so 
just maybe a bit of the history for those of you who don't know of CSR radar capability. Interesting thing is that the first president of the CSR, Dr. Basil Shonland, developed the first radar in South Africa in 1939. And then he became the president of the CSR. And the CSR has been working in radar ever since. Actually, uh, quite a significant increase in the scope of work that we have been done doing since about 1990. Um, and this slide just tries to show sort of some of the CSR's role. We pride ourselves that we go out into the field, so we're really solving the problems in the real world. Like that, that low angle tracking algorithm there is something that has been installed on the frigates as an upgrade to that radar. Uh, and a lot of work in modern radar techniques, such as classification of what the radar is picking up. What I wanted to do also, just sort of in the context of a bit of history, uh, is to juxtapose the manner in which we have tried to do innovation, a sort of commercialization and industrial development over the last 20 years. There's a number of examples. You'll all be aware of the CSR's sort of latest sort of new strategy that's been developed in the last five years about really working closely with industry and commercialization. It's something that we've actually because of our role within the DOD as well, been doing for quite some time, for, for a number of decades. And um, I'd like to just sort of show different, different models of how that has happened to juxtapose that against what we're doing now. So a lot of these, there's a lot of been opportunities, there's been a lot of capability development, but there hasn't really been a huge success of taking something to the global market. And I think that's the difference where we, the trajectory we are on at the moment. So this is the radar that's on the frigates. It was developed by our Reutig Radar Systems. Our role there was to, to first in the 90s, develop the, the background technology to that, transfer that to industry, and we worked closely with them then to develop that. We did one or two bespoke subsystems there. So that's an example, which is also seems to be the history across the world with such complex systems as radars that often the big radars that you see being sell, sold internationally first was a local development for a government need meeting the requirements within that country. And then from there, it was taken out to product, which is interesting, you'll see is a bit different to what we're doing here. This is another example that we did with Reutig Radar Systems. This one, Reutig came up with the original innovation and we then took out our knowledge and we worked with them to do a lot of the modeling of the system and take responsibility for some of the algorithms that were in that radar. Um, as an institute, also to get revenue, um, we have also taken things out to the international market. Uh, we have found there's a market for some of our facilities that we use to develop to provide service to the, our own defense force, and we've found that other institutes have interest, to, interest for that, and it's not something where industries play because it's not, it's not high volume. Um, this is something more recent. I think many of you will know about the Meerkat Was in the Kruger National Park, and this is really a technology push from the CSR. We've, we took that a prototype in the, in the Kruger Park, and it's made a difference over there. Um, we're going to have a talk later on that in a bit more detail. But we've taken new technology, um, array technology, and we've developed a newer version, a, a radar that's really aimed at um, bringing true automation to that security problem. Um, so that, And then here's two more, which are sort of technology pushes. The one is UAV SAR, where the CSR is really the sort of de developing the technology and also doing work to understand the market and understand the requirements to be able to take that to market. We're doing similar things in space-borne synthetic aperture radar, and Billy Nell will be talking about that a little bit later. The, and, but there, that same role has been played along with our space industries, partnering with space industries. But it's also very much a technology push kind of technology. Right, in 2019, we, we um, signed a, sorry, beginning 21, we signed a, um, a Development agreement with Hensolt to develop this. We CSR's role is really to be the technology partner. Hensolt is the product owner. It's their product. They do the marketing. They take it to market. They will support it through the years. Our role is really to be design authority on that product. Now, the interesting thing, the difference over here is really 
that it's not a system that's been developed of, for local government from local government money. This is really a strongly business case driven from Hensels itself. Okay, and it's linked. Um, Yaku showed you that TRS um, 3D radar. Um, the system engineer on that happens to be an ex-South African who worked at Reutek Radar Systems and went over to Reutek and to, to, to Hensolt in Germany and came back to South Africa and saw an opportunity here with all the value systems that Jaku put on the table and said, well, um, he has a very strong understanding of the market niche of the product and what a competing radar should be, a strong understanding of what price point we need and how to balance nice to haves with um, with things that re we really need to achieve. So this thing has been driven very, very strongly against the business case and along with that also strongly with the market need and understanding that market and a whole insult international market force which is busy, busy marketing the system internationally. So just to elaborate on the roles and responsibilities of the two organizations in this partnership, um, there's obviously skills that complement from the two organizations to make this development possible, and that's why we set up the development agreement. But in this agreement, there's responsibilities. So Hensolt, as Andre mentioned, is responsible for the product management, to manage the product over the entire life cycle, from conceptualization right through um, production and support. We're also responsible for the system engineering of the prime system. We're responsible to industrialize the system and eventually produce it uh, in South Africa. Um, we do the procurement, so we manage the whole supply chain to get all the components into the system. We do the com commercialization, so we're responsible for the product, for the business development to get it to the market. And then we also design the lock and support engineering to support the system once it has been deployed uh, at the site of the customer. Then the CSIR is responsible to develop the core radar system and to manage that te technology and support the technology throughout the life cycle of the system. They manage the, the technology, as I said. They do the uh, building of the prototype system and the building blocks of that system. And then also for the radar signal processing and including the, the tracking of all the targets in the system. So maybe this sort of elaborates a little bit on that. Um, firstly, the, every single time Hensold management came over here, they are actually, they say they're quite astounded at how closely and integrated the teams work together. So we've got a formal development agreement. We properly understand each of the responsibilities, but then the teams almost put that aside and support each other very closely on the different parts that they do, okay? So this diagram at the bottom over here sort of because it summarizes what Yaku was saying about responsibility. We develop the core radar. The core radar is effectively the heart of the whole radar sensing function from the antenna, signal processor, data processor, control of that whole radar function. Um, and part of developing Hensolt South Africa's radar, Hensolt bought um, Talumat, who have a lot of experience in all those product level um, elements that they had. So we form a very close team with them. Um, and very importantly, you'll later on, we're going to talk about the concurrent engineering process, um, which is required to get the, 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 the product to market in the time that we need to get it to market. And um, so wherever we can, even though it's our responsibility, if the skills lie somewhere else, the knowledge lies somewhere else while we're busy developing, even the first board, we're already getting the review from an industrialization point of view from the people who will be manufacturing it in, within Hensolt. So. Just to elaborate on some of the building blocks of the Quadome radar. So it's very important that this system should have a very small footprint because it also needs to be deployed on smaller type of vessels. Um, also like combat vessels and aux auxiliary vessels. It consists of just a few uh, major parts. The one is the radar antenna system. Then it's the radar pedestal um, system at the bottom left on which the antenna is, is based. Then the radar processing cabinet and the power and conditioning cabinet, the 
two cabinets that you see there to the right. So most of the complexity resides in, in the antenna system itself. So the, the phase array technology that was developed by the CSIR is now packaged and incorporated into that antenna. It's a very dense packaging. It's very complex. There's very a lot of um, active elements that go into that antenna. That antenna also need to be cooled and it needs to operate in very harsh environmental conditions. And there's also an IFF system uh, or an IFF antenna that's incorporated into that antenna. Um, in the radar processing cabinet, that, that's where the complexity in terms of the signal processing reside. So the control of the radar, the processing of the waveform, and the tracking of targets, it all happens in the radar processing cabinet. And in the power and conditioning cabinet uh, is responsible for the supply of power, the cooling unit sits in that cabinet, as well as the dry air supply. That's the system. So um, the capabilities that we're trying to establish, we're trying to establish a radar capability within South Africa and expand that. So that consists of project management capability, system engineering skills, uh, this radar design capability, quality, and then lock and support to support the system through the life cycle. And then this system is done in partnership, partnership with industry, um, then the partnership with the CSIR and universities. Um, we currently have various uh, lecturers from the University of Pretoria that's involved in our project that also help with uh, signal and tracking processing algorithms. So just to give you a, an idea of some of the partners that we, that's a part of the development of the system, there you see companies like uh, Imtech, um, Trax, University of Pretoria, GW, that's also part of the Insult Group, um, BST, MMS. Uh, we also have com uh, companies that are buying houses and agents that help us to um, secure the supply of components, also from foreign suppliers. And then we have uh, small, uh, micro and medium enterprises also involved in the project, also to help us with uh, production and then to support testing, especially when we have to do environmental verification and system performance verification we make use of facilities at various companies. So what are the challenges that we face on, on this project? Firstly, it's a very complex system. Um, I've already uh, tried to elaborate on this. It's, it's a multifunctional system. This project spans over various organizations. We have a very ambitious development schedule, almost impossible schedule that we need to adhere to. We have a tight budget. We have supply chain challenges like uh, all companies that uh, have to manufacture systems are aware of. We had COVID. We have geographical separation. It's just within the insult group, we have facilities in um, Pretoria area and then also in, in Cape Town. And, and we have challenges with facilities. So how do we mitigate all these challenges that we have? Um, I have a belief that there's always more solutions than these uh, challenges. So we all, always have to take that uh, into account. So on a complex system, we have multi-skilled resources. We have experienced system engineering team and a project management team. And we use very modern tools like model-based system engineering to support the system engineering um, process. Um, we have a diverse team with multiple skills, with deep experience that, that's involved from all the various organizations. Then very importantly, we have a well-organized and structured team. Later I'll show you just a, a high-level organigram of the team. And we collaborate across various uh, platforms and we use uh, virtual platforms like MS Teams um, and others. We Then we use a process of concurrent engineering to address the problem of this very ambitious uh, schedule that we need to adhere to. So a lot of things happen in parallel. We're already ramping up to production. We already address uh, lock and support uh, plan that we need to put in place once we deploy the system. 
and um, there's various other functions. And, the, and then we build capability in parallel to the development. Um, we need to adhere to the schedule. I mean, that's the most important thing. If you want to keep costs down, stick to the schedule. Because once this army is marching, it's very difficult to contain the cost. So that, that is the bottom line. Put the peg in the sand and stick to it. We, we have established a dedicated uh, procurement team to address our supply chain challenges. So that team is uh, meeting weekly and we're monitoring the progress on, on supply chain all the time. We also have to do early procurement. Traditionally, you would have procured as late as possible to, to manage your financial, um, uh, your financial timeline. But now we need to procure early. If a component is available, you, you buy it. And sometimes you, you, you buy a component and you design around that component. Because if you don't have that component, you don't have a system. So the, the, the uh, procurement strategy has changed quite dramatically um, than in the past. Um, we've been, this whole team has been established in the COVID period. So we had to organize the team we had to organize ourselves and run through virtual platforms like Teams, and we had to structure ourselves to work remotely. That was quite a challenge, but I think in that regard, we've been quite successful. And we've now built a team of more than 50 employees working directly on the project. If I count in employees working through um, contractors and the supply chain, there's much probably more than 80 um, employees on the project. The geographical um, separation, we have to work remotely daily um, to, to, to communicate effectively um, um, amongst the team members. And in facilities, we make use of existing facilities that reside at the CSIR and Hensold. We're also expanding our facilities. We're in the process to um, commission and deploy a near field test range at our facility in Cape Town, and we've built a new production plant at our uh, offices in Cape Town. So that's in process. And then we also use other facilities that exist, like at um, uh, facilities like Hotec, IMT in Simonstown, RDMF test facilities, and, and the facilities at Armscore. So just to expand on one or two of those points in a little bit more detail, this is the traditional um, V diagram in system engineering. So on where are we now? Um, so even though the agreement was signed in 2021, as part of that whole trusting partnership, we actually started developing more than a year before then. Um, the, we are now pretty much at the bottom of this V. Um, so the left of the hand side is the is the design phase, capturing requirements, going through preliminary design and detailed design. Um, but more importantly, not explicitly shown on this, is that concurrent engineering. So right from the beginning, we've been prototyping and specifically prototyping and integrating as well, because in such a complex system, the interfaces are often, often some of the things that, that come back to bite you. Um, and now we are in the process of integrating our of what we call that core radar, those, those um, prototype for that, and then we'll be going in up through the the system prototype and the and the reference systems at quite some pace. Um, the as we go through this um, build and verification and integration verification phase. Um, so if we look at that concurrent engineering approach, um, you can see there's a lot of overlap here, and this really is what's been happening. So. We started doing concept design, but on some of the things that we knew were Cree and on the critical path, detailed design started even um, sort of early on um, and then doing the lower level designs as well. And as I talked about earlier um, in the previous slide, doing a lot of integration and developing the sort of test jigs, do integration testing um, to make sure that everything is working because we can't afford to, to build this radar three times. Um, the, the business case just does not allow it. Um, and then design verification, and then as I mentioned much earlier in the, the talk, um, industrialization starting very early. When we, as soon as we started, some of the, the phased array boards that we were working on, the production engineers came and looked and reviewed that so that we are continuously taking that sort of joint review with all the skills in, in place, really to short circuit, the num short circuit the number of cycles of build that we have to do. 
So another tool that we use to uh, leverage on our system engineering process is what we call model-based uh, system engineering. We currently use a tool that's called Cradle. So in these tools, you get a vast array. It's, it's like a holistic functionality that you get to manage your project. You can literally manage your system requirements process, project management, risk management, verification, your whole configuration management. So we, we might use mainly of the core building block that you see in the center. So we manage the requirements with this tool throughout the life cycle of the system and then all the verification methods. So all the tests that need to be performed to verify that the system is performing according to requirements is implemented in this tool and it's fully traceable from the beginning to the end. You can also do the uh, the system breakdown of the system, the product breakdown, you can capture the system and the requirements and keep it traceable throughout the life cycle of the system. So what are the lessons learned on this project so far in terms of organization and process and a successful execution of the project? Firstly, trust. Trust is everything. The trust that we have in this partnership between CSIR and Hensolt is, is, is non-negotiable. I think the fact that we were able to integrate a very tight team and to work together and communicate freely and openly uh, on this project is key to the successful execution of the project. We had to organize this project across multiple organizations. So here you see just a very high level organigram. Um, the, the green part is the, the Hensel system engineer and project management structure. And uh, the blue part is the CSIR uh, management structure. And there's very good collaboration. Um, it's, it's basically one team working together. We also had to sort out our contracting models of suppliers. That's critical to have a good contract in place with every supplier that's involved in a project. Then, like we said, we follow very proper system engineering processes and we have good tools in place like the model-based system engineering. We function like an integrated project team uh, where everyone has a very specific role and function to, to make a contribution to the project. Communication and reporting is critical. We have weekly meetings on, on all the aspects of the team from project management right through to the element managers. And we have to communicate regularly, uh, frequently, and we have a value system of transparency. Risk management is very critical. We have to um, identify the risks as early as possible. We have to manage those risks and we have to put mitigation measures in place to make sure that uh, we can manage a risk and if a risk realize that we have ways and means to, to manage it. Then the stakeholder management, especially between the, the managers of the, the CSIR and Hensolt and then the, our, our um, the partners in Germany, um, we have regular steering meetings where the managing committee meet and we negotiate on the, we or revisit the terms and conditions and we revisit budgets and schedule and give uh, feedback on that. So in conclusion, we really believe this is a flagship uh, development program in, in South Africa that has been established. This is a proudly South African development. This is done by South African resources that's working on a project. It's a multi-party, multi-organization project. We involve industry as far as possible. We are busy establishing core radar development capability in the country, and that will be supported by a whole supply chain that's been uh, developed in the process. We create many job opportunities. As I said, there's already um, 50 employees working directly on the project and indirectly everyone working in the supply chain that's also involved. And then we create many um, international uh, marketing opportunities. So we already have a lot of interest in the project. We have sent out uh, um, um, 
multitude of proposals to potential customers and we believe that we're going to sell uh, many of these systems. Thank you very much and thank you Arthur for joining me for this thank talk. You. Thanks so much. Okay, yeah, no, uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, gentlemen. Uh, I think we'll take uh, a few questions. All right, thanks. Just a couple of questions. One, Hansalt, I suppose, is a privately owned organization, correct? And then CSR, oh, is it? Well, we, uh, the Hansalt group in Germany is listed on the German stock exchange. Okay, perfect. So I just want to find out how exactly did you establish that partnership between a state-owned organization like the CSIR and Hansalt? Was it through an open tender of some sort? I work for Transnet, so I'm very keen on finding out how you managed to um, establish that partnership. That's one. Number two, when it comes to selling the idea, like you mentioned that you're looking to commercialize the product itself, how exactly are you negotiating your IP ownership or uh, what would it be? IP ownership or royalties, correct, that's the word. I'm an engineer, so the words escape my mind. And then the third one is how long did it take for you to facilitate that partnership from when the need was arised to eventually when you managed to start working together? Thanks. All right, thanks, yeah. So before you answer, I think let's take two more questions. Sure, then I need to write them down. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Director of Technology Development for the uh, Defense Force, um, and I've listened to th um, these type of uh, presentations. Thank you very much. I think it was very informative and also very um, elaborative in terms of what you guys have done over the years. I believe that the demonstrator has already been um, uh, produced and that you're now working into the industrialization of, of, of uh, the Kodam. With regard to the IP, and once again, the issue goes about is that uh, the minister this morning indicated that we must be working smarter and more collaboratively with one another. We have a similar system now also uh, where the DOD is spending a lot of money in terms of Mr. Esau, which is the multi-role um, surveillance radar, um, busy with Roitek in Cape Town, uh, Roitek uh, radar solutions. Why did you guys not uh, collaborate? Because now we've got two systems. So it's, it's two um, local product uh, systems and the Defense Force must make a decision as to which way, either Hensel's way or Roitek's way, or both at that moment, which makes it very difficult because we spend money on both sides, not in the Hensel in, uh, in particular, but on the CSR side in terms of knowledge, skill, and expertise. So the question that I would like to ask is, why did you not start with the collaboration, looking at you, what you've presented in terms of, this is a very um, intriguing uh, system. It is um, money uh, orientated in terms of budget, and um, looking at the timelines, what is your timelines in terms of industrialization to have the first product of the Navy on, on, uh, available? And then obviously, uh, that's the second one, sorry. And then obviously looking at um, the way forward in terms of collaborating with Roitech and all the other companies. I mean, you've bought the uh, telemet out already. So what's the future in terms of insult, in terms of this product? And is it only for local uh, or are you gonna industrialize it globally? Thank you. Okay, so I think I'll allow the colleagues to take these, but then uh, take notes. Of, oh, well, there's one more. Okay, so um, I, I hope it's not going to be a compound question. <laughs> Those are not allowed. So yeah, you sign about an X sign, right? I'm not compound a compound person. I just want to ask a question. I'm I'm Sefiso from the colleagues yeah. who are presenting. They are saying they have made a collaboration with this German company, and Sorry. then I, I'm saying you are saying. This company that you have made a collaboration in is listed in German. And uh, what you are exploring is that you are looking at taking this product to outside South Africa. I'm not a defense person. But if we are going to use this radar to, for, with the, the naval, our Navy, for an example, from um, um, a patriotic perspective, I will believe that for our Navy, the radar should be better than what we're going to sell, sell overseas. So, so that we, in case that the countries that we have sold this radar, we are in conflict with, we will have a competitive edge. So how do you navigate around that? It's a simple question. Yeah, no, very interesting questions. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to urge the colleagues to think carefully before answering any of these questions. 
Okay, let's let, let's start. No, no, we'll, we'll, we'll do a second round. But yeah, like I said, think carefully. Less is more. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks, Innocent. Um, we might just ask for a keyword here or there, but I think your first question was how was the partnership established? So I think that talks to the different models that we talked about. This is not a technology push. So although we had the technology, Hensel identified it. So there wasn't an open call because Hensel came to the CSOR as an institute. Okay. Um, and said, well, we want to work with you. And then that went through. We put some proposals, costing um, on the table. And quite an open process. We talked about this being business case driven. So even then, the, the trusting relationship quickly grew. And in sharing, in terms of sharing the details of the business case to allow the negotiations to take in that context, rather than sort of blindly giving prices out to, to each other. So that whole open process went, went in that manner. Okay, then I think you talked, you asked a question about IP. Um, so it's important for the CSR. I mean, we're a, a technology organization. <laughs> um, it's hard work to get contract R&D income continuously. So we need IP accretion. Okay? So the negotiation is around us being able to still own the core IP that we use and licensing it to Hensolt. And obviously there were various negotiations about royalties and stuff around that as well, so that there is um, sort of joint benefit around that. Your third question, keyword? <laughs> Again, it came to that trusting thing, you know. So um, we, we, we created a process where we said, well, let's do it in steps. Let's put an MOU together that really talks about the high level principles and under those principles we actually started working together on some of the things Sensalt gave an interim contract right in the beginning for us to do some concept development while that was all developed so I think that whole negotiation process took about a year yeah maybe just uh, so 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 um, on the first question I think it's also it's, it's important as um, Andre is alluding that uh, we've got different ways of uh, engaging with partners so we do have active origination where we can actually ourselves conceptualize projects and we go and approach partners but we also have passive origination where we are actually maintaining an open door so partners can come through and if there's a strategic fit then we can uh, engage i think i will <coughs> first answer the question about the navy so um yes they, they so so just to recap um, it, w the proposition was that uh, let the superior product be reserved for South Africa and that for potential foreign adversaries, uh, perhaps do not provide a, <laughs> a product which is uh, on par. It depends on who's willing to pay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, 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 a lot of, there's a lot of interest from the South African Navy to have this radar um, deployed on their ships. So we are talking to the South African Navy. They are also willing to support us in the development and the testing of such a system. But I think we are all aware of the funding challenges that we currently have in a, from the DOD and especially in, a, in the domain of the Navy. So that, that negotiation will be ongoing. So we are definitely going to offer this as a solution the requirement, the real requirement that exists in the South African Navy. So I, I cannot really comment on the funding and the funding that's available, but we would like to give the best product to the Navy. Can I maybe add something? So I was involved, quite involved in things like the acquisition of the Gripen radar from um, from Sweden, and I can um, and these kind of things exist. You know, we know that there are export versions and non-export versions. I think the point here, if you go back to the whole value system of this thing, it is strongly business case and market driven. Okay, so there are advanced features which we don't even put into the radar because, you know, if we come up with a feature, there, the 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 message from um, from the the principal in Germany is said if it ch makes the price the, the thing more expensive because that's really driven for international market wasn't it wasn't developed for this that does not mean we have a strong radar we've got an unusually strong radar capability in south africa both here at the csr and various industries that does not mean that when um the south african navy buys one of these things we have many other techniques that we've developed that aren't in this that we cannot because we actually design authorities as well that we cannot add things to the system 
and address certain requirements, advanced electronic warfare measures, target classification, all of those kind of things. So that's the way, that's the model that I would approach that. We agree, support right. it. Yeah. So, so, so Iaco, if you could um, quickly address the gentleman's question. Uh, this was quite a politically laden yeah. question. <laughs> um, Less is more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will be I will be hesitant to stick my neck out in terms of the funding. Um, I mean, uh, South African funding to Roytech and a CSIR. I think that's a yeah, very no, no, loaded I, I question. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I think maybe the the the, the, the what should maybe focus on is more the issue around collaboration because I think the gentleman he was talking about the fact that. Uh, you know, uh, could you not have collaborated, let's say, with uh, certain other parties or not? So maybe I think it's maybe important just to sort of provide the context. I think Andre did provide it to this to the extent yeah, that exactly. there was already a, a sort of product proposition initially. Hensel came to yeah. us and said that South African requirements would be also useful to be taken into account, but they were looking for a world product. Okay, um, and that's and I mean we are the technology partner with. Sorry, we are the technology. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Matori, is, it, is that better? Um, so the um, the um, yeah, so we we it was really came from a world market point of view, and that that was really driven by Hensel strategy in terms of the way that the product was being developed. Um, I do know that they are also quite an open company, and they do also talk to um, to RRS. So I think there is opportunities for collaboration going forward. Yeah, this partnership is definitely not exclusive. So we did approach uh, Roytech to help us on one of the key components of the of the radar. Unfortunately, at that point in time, it did not make commercial sense to to incorporate and to contract uh, Roytech on that. But we're still talking to Roytech. We we're still looking at opportunities where maybe in future they can produce some of the core parts of the radar. So we open to discuss that. Okay. And I think the other the other leveraging is sort of such a product development. In essence, it's also bringing further investment that actually magnifies the investment that the DoD has made in various places like the CSR. I mean that technology that um, and that IP is available on other programs as well. So. Yeah. Okay. So I think the the sort of quick takeaway is that um, I, this is the beginning of it, it's not the the be all and end all mm. actually so so i think but but this is a very important start uh, taking heed of what the minister said this morning that we need to have more collaboration in order to build economic uh, revival for this country we cannot have uh, various companies and um, doing different things but at the same time they're actually doing <coughs> producing the same type of uh, requirements for the defense so we the defense cannot buy uh, from both parties. We need to make a decision at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that will also ultimately depends on which system is the, the best or the niche. But the other question was in terms of your um, industrialization, what, what is the timelines? When will you have your first product on the table? Yeah. That's easy, right? <laughs> it's easy to answer. Let's Not wrap to it up on that easy one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we we are all, we've already started with the industrialization. Like I said, we're already busy ramping up to production. We're putting all the plans in place. Our current goal is to have systems available by the second half of 2024. The first naval systems commercially available that can be shipped to customers. It's a very ambitious schedule, but that's what we aim for. Okay, thank you. I, I, I take it there's no final question. Burning, just one. No, we're, we're not taking that question. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, colleagues, thank you very much. Uh, maybe one or two questions. Uh, <laughs> they are very serious. Okay, maybe let's start with the one, uh, then the rest will follow. Maybe the first one. Uh, based on your organogram, uh, the diversity of that group seems to be very questionable. Uh, what is the strategy of this project uh, with the transformation imperatives uh, of this country? That's one. And uh, what is the biggest challenge that you faced in executing this program, as complex as it is, Yaku? Uh, and I think the present, lastly, the presentation was focused more on the model, the partnership, uh, what are the high-level system specifications of this particular radar? Because that did not come out clearly. Thanks. 
Okay, so uh, I'll exercise prerogative. So you'll just answer the first two questions briefly. We are really behind time. Okay, uh, in South, South Africa, subscribe to the Defence Charter. And we believe that we have a social responsibility to make an impact on, on society in general. And to, in the end, um, reflect the, the population and involve skills and resources that's available. It is a challenge because many people in, in the radar domain traditionally come from historic backgrounds and has a lot of experience in that field. So it's a, it's a real challenge. It's something we, we have to address and we're continuously addressing. So it, we have a plan to, to work on that. Right, okay. So, 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 so I, I, think, I think with that uh, we can uh, give our gentlemen uh, you know, a good round of applause. All right, thank you so much.